Hello, welcome to the RSA Augmented Society interview series. My name is Joe Glazer, and today I'll be interviewing Zoe Camper, who is the co-founder of the Augmented Society. Uh, and this is the first of what we hope will be more interviews of the RSA fellows in our group. Uh, the goal of this series is to provide members of the RSA with a profile of their fellow fellows and take a deep dive into their passions and interests so that you, as the listener, can know the people who, you're, who are in your community and who want to collaborate with you. So without further ado, we'll introduce our first very brave subject, <laughs> Zoe Camper. Hello. Zoe Camper is a cognitive computing specialist living in Las Vegas, Nevada. She is a London native and has been an RSA fellow since 2004. Zoe has over 20 years experience adding value to organizations in the realm of person-centered design, digital transformation, and systems development. She's an AI enthusiast. Uh, she helped deploy IBM Watson into the medical research field, as well as built a health chatbot that's able to interact with patients in a specially tailored tone of voice. Her work has been published in AI journals and magazines. She's a regular speaker on BBC Radio and at conferences focused on digital evolution and emerging technologies. And she's a lecturer at the University of the Arts in London and the BBC Academy. Zoe has a degree in 3D art from the University of Surrey, a postgrad in education design technology from the University of London, and is an avid visual artist. And I will say personally that her paintings are amazing and her drawings too. Highly recommend you check them out. You're very kind. So, first question for you is, tell me, you, you have a background as a visual artist. So tell me how you went from being an artist to becoming a specialist in cognitive computing. Well, it's a very long journey, so I'll try and keep it short, but my underlying interest has always been technology. So uh, when I was at university, computers were just coming in, but it seemed to me to be the future. And at that time, I used it to create 3D visualizations. It became a communication mechanism for me. I uh, was actually a teacher in the UK of technology as well. And I saw it as a fantastic way to explain myself and I guess in a way explain the world. So it, it just became something that was fundamental to what I did on a day-to-day a -day basis. How I moved from images to words um, I'm not entirely sure, but I think it was based in wanting to be understood and equally wanting to explain. And that was a natural progression into all things technology. So there's always been that underlying uh, need for communication, whether it be visual or word based um, or in any other form. So I think that kind of that's the link to me in everything. Very cool. So with some of this work that you're doing in cognitive computing and, and in technology and design kind of intersecting, what are some of the projects? Like what's some of the work that you've done and what's some of the, what are the accomplishments that you're most proud of in your career? Well, uh, going back in time, we did the first ever Wimbledon tennis website. Um, which feels like a million years ago, but we were so proud of that at the time. Moving forward, I think my, uh, my most recent work, which is about to go live, is uh, an interactive uh, web app for the Neon Museum here in Las Vegas. But I guess the pinnacle is the voice work and the virtual assistant work that I did in the UK for people who are suffering and in chronic pain. That is a, a real highlight for me and one that, that gave me an incredible experience and actually had one of the most valuable outcomes of any kind of, of technical implementation. Very cool. So what, what was your particular role in that and what were some of the challenges that you faced in, in implementing that? It sounds very complex. It was incredibly complex. I, I was very lucky to be head of digital at a time when an organization was willing to take on change and commit to it 100%. I led the project, I did the initiation work, I then headed up the team, recruited the team, did 
did the scoping work um, in combination with IBM and then delivered the first phase of the entire project. I was allowed such free reign and, which was fundamental, the backing of senior management and the money that was required. Now that's a, a three-way thing that happens very rarely, I think, uh, in anyone's career. And with that level of backing, I had the freedom to think very big. And that's exactly what we did. The challenges uh, were in describing um, voice or conversation to people. And interestingly, but incredibly dull, was the introduction of GDPR, which then became so incredibly important um, so that we could wipe people's records, for example, so that we could be absolutely accountable for any conversation that somebody had with our virtual assistant. It sounds a bit boring, but it's so important and groundbreaking. Now I'm here in the States, there's no, there is, a, there is, we don't have GDPR here and it's a very different world, but I think the two challenges were describing and bringing people along and dealing with the data interchange. And you're speaking of GDPR, the, the regulations in the UK that are to protect yeah. user information from traveling over orders, correct? Absolutely, correctly. And my right yeah. to have it removed. So I just mm -hmm. love what, what Europe has been doing in that. Uh, and it's a bit astonishing to come over here and find out that there isn't anything that's like that. <laughs> well, let's get into that a little bit. Like, what are your feelings about, about data security, data privacy, and how has that, how, how have you seen that in your experience working with IBM, working uh, with different organizations? Is it something that people are talking about or do you feel like you're the only one who really cares about it? I think everyone cares and I think it's a discussion that is being had. In the UK, it was a discussion that had to be had. Over here, it's still kind of optional. In terms of data ownership as well, you've got several ways of looking at that. You've got your customer data and then you've got your right to use your own data. And that is something, if you bring up IBM, that they are um, absolutely strict about. So there's no screen scraping, there's no um, borrowing of anything. If you don't own your data, you can't use it. So I find that that's quite an interesting position when we all run fast and loose with client data, but our own data absolutely has to be ours. So there's some interesting parallels, I think, to be drawn um, in that. Um, mm -hmm. I would prefer there to be a bigger discussion over here, but I also quite like the freedom again to, to trial and to find out, um, as opposed to some of the drag that comes with having to work within the realms of GDPR. So I'm curious about, you know, while we're on the subject of data, data privacy, what are your thoughts? And, and I know that you've worked with chatbots, uh, virtual assistants in the, in the past. Do you feel like that is also an area where privacy is really important? I know that some of us have these machines in our house and they could be recording every single conversation that's going on in the house. Yeah. And, and that's incredibly problematic. Um, and I'm sure you've seen the ghost of your conversation in front of you um on a number of occasions which is is definitely spooky <laughs> but what i have been inspired by was um a few people i've met along the way who want a, a, a hands-free interaction with the incredible technology that we have i find using a keyboard incredibly backward i'm looking at mine now and whilst it's a lovely bright red color you know what is this Q W E R T Y thing that I'm supposed to interact with. Um, it's a barrier both from um, a language perspective, a physical perspective. So I'm willing to let a few things go. But having said that, there needs to be a huge conversation about what is going on in your own front room. It's a, a wild west, quite literally and it's being abused 
and we must have that conversation. Well, it might be something that happens uh, more in a reactionary sense because it <laughs> seems like the technology is just pushing forward. There doesn't seem to be any anything stopping it. Yeah, so I had a very funny incident once when I set up an Alexa in our London office and I let people know it was there, but they did not understand that everything that was being said I would see in text form later. And we had a lady mm -hmm. who loved musicals and she spent the whole afternoon singing with the Alexa and asking for the <laughs> next musical and it was hilarious, but that painted a picture that was, it was, she did not react well when I showed her it, but it was my duty to say to her, look, I told you that was going to happen, but look, this is, this is the reality of it. So, you know, that came back at us very quickly. Yeah, very interesting. <laughs> so one of the things, you know, aside from the privacy conversation around virtual assistants and chatbots, I'm really curious about the technology itself and how it's, advanced or how it's kind of is in my experience kind of plateaued my experience in in working with a with an assistant is that it's not the smartest thing it doesn't have a memory it doesn't really engage in dialogue it can't it can barely search the internet for me most of the, the requests i make to it end up with i'm sorry i don't know how to answer that why do you think what do you think is holding back the technology um so I don't think anyone really understands the effort that's needed to actually build a virtual assistant. Um, it's a very, uh, it's a, a trained, very narrow domain. It takes months to get it right. You have to understand what it is that you're an expert in. So if I'm concentrating as we did on domains, for example, there is weeks, months of work, on actually understanding what questions people are going to ask and how you're going to respond to that. So natural language processing is a vastly complex and a, a, a subject area that you fully commit to. Expecting it to work in a human-like way quickly is never going to happen. So I think people underestimate the 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 skill level if you like of, of the technology that we have currently now also creating a state within a chatbot virtual assistant is something that we struggled with immensely so holding a state or a context for a conversation became incredibly important very quickly now that's some mm -hmm. fairly detailed programming work so if i say to you where where are you in pain and you say well it's my knee I don't expect you to come back and have to tell me it's your knee again. I want you to know that we know that. So a lot of us mm -hmm. went into not just knowing the kinds of questions that our users were going to ask, but it was in holding the state within which that conversation had to take place. So mm -hmm. you've got full on programming uh, and NLP sitting on top. The amount of effort that takes is huge. I think people's expectations of chatbots are ri ridiculous. It's, it's just not the way they are. <laughs> so let's switch gears a little bit. I wanted to kind of open it up because with within the Augmented Society Network, it's, it's not just about chatbots. It's not just about AI. Um, there are a lot of other subjects. So could you maybe give a quick overview of how you perceive the augmented society? Like what is the, the scope of it? And maybe some of the things that you're most interested yeah. within that. The augmented society network has come about because of just a massive need for conversation. The Royal Society of Arts uh, are phenomenal at creating dialogue and also gaining support and influence. It seemed like a, a very happy marriage. And uh, Jonathan and I have been incredibly uh, interested in this topic, passionate about sharing it, but more so getting influence and making the conversations that need to happen, happen. The scope of the network is kind of unbound in a way in that we've uh, included 
a huge array of technologies that are being used to augment society. But it equally goes back to discovering fire, for example. You know, it, we've augmented throughout history. But then a very interesting conversation about a right-handed pair of scissors. How do you use those if you're left-handed? Well, they don't work. So how is this technology being implemented? And is it really what we need or is it what the dominant tribe needs? And then the issues that uh, we will encounter with the excluded or uh, less uh, connected society who will be dragged along and that's just not that is so wrong from from our perspective so the idea is to to get people connecting get the conversation going leverage all the fantastic people in the RSA and really create momentum now the things I'm passionate about are telling the story accurately about for me particularly artificial intelligence so i'm working on a timeline that will will show and make clear the story so far from extraordinary beginnings with the likes of alan turing obviously stanislav ulam norbert weiner the the ai winters and the resurgence recently i want people to be able to live in a context of that and understand you know just how interested they should be um, mm -hmm. so that's my main kind of area of interest but along with that is just the fantastic discussions mm -hmm. and the ability to influence and if you connect that up with uh, blockchain for example uh, you'll hear a lot about democratizing uh, or technology being used to democratize well you know surely that's blockchain so it's about understanding the impact of these new technologies and using the platform of the Royal Society to get us there. It's just a great mm -hmm. opportunity. So with that effort that you're doing with this timeline, uh, to use it as an example, what type of support or resources would you be looking for, you personally, in getting oh. that done? <laughs> yeah, well, lots of time from people who know stuff. Um, you know, I have <laughs> one outlook, just one outlook. That's not good enough to build an objective as far as we can timeline. It's about other people's understandings, other people's areas of expertise, other people's contexts. So this is not a job one person can do. And realizing that is, is something that I did several months ago and thought, oh, okay, this is our chance. So it, it can only happen with other people being involved. Um, and that's where the collaboration. I also thought I really would love to build things. So underlying this is the desire to do some mashups with AI, um, to, to work with Watson Discovery, for example, and put in the data that we're generating, finding meaning in that, and all of those things that come as a result of creating content audio recordings like we're doing now, you know, we can analyze that. What would we come out with? What's really being said? Can AI help us with that? Maybe not. I don't know. But it's about getting all of those um, things together. And that is not the work of one person. And it's boring on your own. <laughs> right. And, and like you were saying, that the purpose of, of this, this group is really to to start those conversations, to build that momentum. And we don't know exactly what's going to come out of it, but we know that once that, you need that momentum there, you need that mastermind in order to create. And as an artist, I'm also an artist, we know that, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Hard to, hard to capture that lightning in a bottle, but um, yeah. it is possible. But yeah, I like that. Very cool. So, all right, you've described your work as uh, helping organizations create their digital voice. Can you describe what a digital voice is and how an organization will know once they've found theirs? Yeah, so in a very basic way, we've gone from asking people to search for paragraphs of information about our contracts, our terms and conditions, our services, our products. That's not acceptable to me as a 
a level of service you have to move to a more conversational form of interaction with your customer that is what i mean it's like we're interacting now if i said mm -hmm. to you, go and actually um joe you you're gonna have to go and find that paragraph um do that now and then come back it's just not acceptable and mm -hmm. what's commerce uh, as it's otherwise known as well is uh, something that all companies will have to engage with at one point or another if they're going to um, be relevant and available for their customers. So it's about being where your customer expects you to be. It's about offering a more seamless or a less frictionful, although that's a rubbish word, <laughs> or actually interacting with your customers. It's, it's no keyboard. It's about the fact that I've got both a Google Hub and an Alexa uh, sitting in the room next door. I don't want to type things. I want to talk to you. That's the digital voice. And that takes a lot of thinking about because dealing with your customer in a, a more telephone based way um, is, is something that, that businesses really do need to um, have a good long thing about, think about. Right. It's, it's the relationship that you have with your customers and it's the, the world is moving in a place where transparency is more expected rather than, than a, um, a luxury. Some companies are, are reducing their terms and conditions to, you know, bullet form and, and maybe a page or two. I read a, um, a, a piece about an insurance company that started to look really deeply into what service they were providing to their customers and realized that one of the biggest issues was how confusing it is to read <laughs> a policy. And yeah. so they said, hey, what if we make, made our policies? What if we took it from 18 pages to two pages? What would happen? And they yeah. found that, yes, customers loved it. Customers were more likely to buy because mm -hmm. they felt that it was more transparent. Absolutely. So companies cannot hide in that detail. And it's, it's mm -hmm. ridiculous to think that you can continue to do that. It's only going to come back at you in, in a customer service perspective. So, you mm -hmm. know, let's get on with it. Let's take the devices away and let's talk to each other. We live in interesting times, do we not? We certainly do, yeah. <laughs> I actually really would prefer to come back in about 40 years' time. <laughs> I, some that of these things are so complicated. I just think 40 years, maybe even 20, maybe 10, maybe five with the way things are going. But I'd love to be looking back at this time. Any predictions? 20, 40 years out? No, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> not going to take the bait. Okay. You can't trick me like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let me, let, me get to, uh, let me get to a few rapid fire questions. Wanna ask some simple things just to kind of get to know you a little bit better. And maybe you have some uh, some cool tidbits or resources for for the people listening. So, first, what book or books are you reading right now? So the the big one, the most impactful for me is Nick Bostrom's uh, Super Intelligence. It is. I've got it. I'm reading it. I've got it on an audio uh, Audible in my car. I'm just digesting it in every form that I possibly can. It's an incredible read. Um, and it blows open um, your way of thinking. So Ginny Romerty mentioned at um, CES this year um, that only something like 1% of the, the data that can be collected has been collected. And if you think about, you think everything's been collected and you know it's the game's over, we're nearly finished. No, absolutely not. This is just the beginning. And Nick Bok Bostrom, helps to take you through that. Another book I'm reading um, is uh, based on how Americans and settlers moved from east to west. And I think it's called American Territories or something like that. So I'm discovering about the country I'm currently living in. And that is, an, uh, a get for me, that's a, an incredible read because all of my, a lot of my knowledge is based in black and white cowboy and western films. You know, I watched mm -hmm. in the Wonder Horse as a child, <laughs> so my view of all of this is so wrong. <laughs> so understanding 
about the country has been absolutely, I'm not there by any means, but that is uh, another fantastic read. Awesome. Great. All right. So how about, um, do you subscribe to any news digest, like email digests that come, come through every day or every week? Anything that you frequently just absolutely love and want to share? Um, there's a couple of AI lists um, that I rely on heavily. Um, I use those as, as ways of getting into things. The national IT newsletter is dull, but I like it. A um, couple of these are British led. Um, I subscribe to Wired and a couple of other um, news lists as well. There isn't one um, that I would say ranks outside of any others. Um, and if anyone's interested, I can I can supply these as a little list as a a subscript for this today, Joe. If that's helpful, let's do that. Definitely, yeah. We'll have a little some show notes for people. Okay. Great. Okay. Is there anyone uh, alive or dead which you wish you could spend an evening with? As of right now, absolutely. It would be Stanislaw or Stanislav Ulam. His um, impact on what is happening now is absolutely phenomenal in terms of the Monte Carlo method. Uh, the way he was, I love the way he discovered it as well. He was told to recuperate, he wasn't well, but he, being the person he was, wouldn't do that. And that's when he was just playing around with patients, for example, and how he discovered this process. I would love to, um, sit with him for an hour. I'd also love to know what his impact was on the Princeton crew that were building the ENIAC, the Maniac, and the very beginnings of uh, a physical computer. So I'd love to actually go back and have dinner with them, um, with Stanislav, um, with a few of the others, um, von Neumann, etc., etc. But you just said one person. So today, it <laughs> Stanislav Ulam, and that's U L M. Maybe. If anyone wants to look that up, awesome. Maybe you can recruit him into the RSA. No, he's dead. <laughs> oh, well, that's yeah, going to be difficult. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, 1984. Interestingly, I think he died. Mm. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Move on. All right, all right. One more question. So, yeah. you're you're traveling right? Yep. You love to travel. So I've give heard. us uh, maybe a few places that were your favorites that you loved, some experiences you want to share from your travels. Okay. So um, a few years ago, I went to Russia and I, I, I just, there was a little thing there about why, why Russians are the way they are that this KGB officer told me. And she shone a light on the differences in the way people are to strangers that, that explained an awful lot to me and then explained the, the Russian American difference, if you like, in that the Russian will scowl at you and uh, your laughter and your smile is for your family. Um, and I hope mm. this is too contentious, but in America, the smile is for everyone. Um, I don't know mm -hmm. what the family, but, but in Russia, you would be considered a fool to, to waste a smile on a stranger. And I've just found that absolutely incredibly interesting to think about. So Russia, I would go back to um, at the drop of a hat. It is very difficult, though, from a visa perspective and everything else. So you've got to do some serious planning um, to do that. Mm. Um, where else? Um, Poland but I'm sounding very Eastern Bloc at the moment. So we went to Palm Springs for the first time this last weekend to Desert X, which is an incredible festival of art. And everything about discovering where I live at the moment is just, I absolutely love it. It's a whole new country that, that I'm with my husband discovering. Um, I, I wake up every morning and just think, wow, how lucky am I? Mm. very nice well thank you for sharing all that oh no it's a pleasure so uh before we 
break off and end this call. How about anything else that you want to share? Uh, definitely want to let people know how to contact you. The best way to contact you. Yeah. Um, any anything you're interested in in getting from the community? Sure. So um, I would like uh, people to join us at augmentedsociety.org. Come and join the conversation. Get involved and make something incredible. Uh, only together, because some of these topics are so big, will we achieve uh, anything. So please join us at Augmented Society. That's all one word, dot org. You could very welcome to email, email me at zoe at slink.net as well, but I think the best way is to go to the Augmented Society dot org and let's join together and create something phenomenal. If you've got some weird ideas tucked away in the back of your mind, if you're an artist like you are, Joe, working within technology as well, boy, have we got some exciting things to explore. If you're a, a mathematician, a project manager, um, if you just love hearing about technology and want to bring your perspective to it, then, to the to the group boy can, we're so excited to have you um and it's just going to be quite a, an exciting ride and to have the royal society of arts support us makes it even more exciting you know this we could actually really do something and that's phenomenal and i would rather be doing it with a huge group of incredible people because um jonathan and i can't do it on our own um, so even meeting you, Joe, has been amazing and meeting the people that met us for our first meeting. You know, this is the beginning of something very special. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. And it's my pleasure. I'm really excited to be a part of this. And I will make a little pitch myself that we started a Slack account, um, a, a Slack community, I should say. So let's, let's make sure that that gets posted on augmentedsociety.org and people can join the Slack community for a little more um, casual back and forth, um, setting up meetings and, and conversations and that sort. Um, from what I understand, augmentedsociety.org is a is a um, a place to publish yeah, ideas well, and articles. Honest, yeah, Joe, as we we'd love to hear from people that have got uh, a a great platform. I've been trialing a mood. Uh, which is a, a version of a MOOC, basically, but that's with um, Delft University. So that I don't know how to get at that publicly. So anybody who's got a good idea in terms of a, a good collaboration uh, platform, Slack's fantastic. Um, we've been talking on that, Joe, haven't we? So that's a great place. I'll make sure that gets on. The blogger platform, it isn't right. It's not the right thing, but we just wanted to get started. So any input on that would be gratefully received. Fantastic. All right. Well, I guess that does it. Thanks so much, Zoe. Oh, it was an absolute pleasure, Joe. And I shall uh, look forward to interviewing you. <laughs> Actually, I think next you get to interview somebody else. And then okay. All yeah, right. that's how this will go. We'll pass the interview baton. So you are going to be the new, the new interviewer. Good Ooh, luck. Thank you. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.